The question is that this House has considered benefit sanctions. Anne McLaughlin. Thank you very much, Mrs Gillan. And can I congratulate my honourable friend, for the member for Bantam Buchan, for this um, possibly the most important debate that can be brought before this House. Um, and we've heard some very important and shocking statistics from her. So I won't repeat them. What I do intend to do is look at the principle of sanctioning people's benefits. Um, share um, a few stories about people in my constituency currently being crucified by these sanctions and say a little bit about what I think lies behind the government's, what the government's motivation is here. So the principle is that if we punish people for, for not wanting to work or not wanting to work hard enough and really make them suffer, it will teach them that they can't always rely on the government to take care of them. And I would challenge the idea that there really are people who don't want to work Yes, there are plenty of them who struggle to find work. There are many reasons, though, why they can't find that work. A lack of jobs, a lack of confidence, no self-belief, an experience of applying over and over and getting nowhere, um, or generational unemployment in the area in which they live. And I also want to challenge this idea that people get comfortable on benefits, on the largesse, of the government. Well, job seekers allowance is about £73 a week. On £73 a week, you will absolutely struggle to pay your living costs. Being cash poor is incredibly time consuming. You have to be very creative to get by. But it's not a fun creativity. It's stressful and depressing. And for many people, it's never ending. I'm sure all of us would argue that we could live on £73 a week. And I agree, we probably could for one week. But try doing it week in, week out, month in, month out. For some people, year in, year out, with absolutely no respite. There are no bonuses if you live on benefits. £73 a week means if your washing machine breaks down, you've had it, nobody's going to fix it for under £50, where will you get the money? It means always being the one to turn up to family weddings and parties in the same outfit and with the cheap present that you know they don't really want, but it's all you can afford. And it means having holes in the bottom of your shoes and getting used to soggy cardboard underfoot, keeping up that facade so that friends don't pity you. It means being in job interviews, trying to focus on coming across well, but spending far too much time worrying that they can hear your shoes squelching because it's embarrassing for people. Being poor can be really embarrassing. So nobody, nobody gets comfortable on benefits. And money does not stop, the money they're given does not stop people looking for work. And yes, there's a problem of low pay and we need to tackle it, but we need to acknowledge that pay is not the only attraction in working. There's the purpose that it gives you, somewhere to go, a reason to get up in the morning, and most importantly of all, the people you interact with on a daily basis, whether you like them or not, the interaction is important. Now, we all know that, but not everybody does. There are areas where there are whole generations who were unemployed for long, long periods of time. If you don't remember your parents working, your aunts and uncles working, how can you know that jobs are about more than money and therefore how do you garner the enthusiasm to apply for all these very low paid jobs? Indeed, did the Honourable Lady who has uh, secured this debate, and I apologise for being late for it, and there are some important points about the most vulnerable in society that are being made, but does the Honourable Lady agree with me that we should be welcoming, for example, today's jobs figures, which show that more people are in work than ever before, and that we have a responsibility of Members of Parliament of promoting those who are in work and the benefits of work that she herself is highlighting? Anne McLaughlin. Um, I represent Glasgow North East, Mrs Gillan, and um, we have the 17th highest rate of unemployment mm -hmm. in the whole of these islands. So I see that my constituents have got very little to cheer about today, although I heard the Prime Minister was most gleeful um, that we'd managed to cut it a little bit overall. Yeah. I uh, grew up... Yeah, I will. Is everybody aware that although there may be more people in work than there was a year ago, the number of hours that we are working as a country, as the United Kingdom, has actually gone down since a year ago, which speaks to the sort of jobs that people are getting? Anne McLaughlin. 
Yes, I was aware of that, and thank you very much for, for highlighting it. Um, I grew up in a shipbuilding town, Mrs Gillen. Uh, I grew up in Greenock in Port Glasgow, and I often tell the story of uh, when I was uh, at Port Glasgow High School, 19... No, I'm not going to tell you what year. Um, <laughs> first year at high school, and every Monday morning, the registration class was a 15-minute class where the teacher would ask, how did you get on at the weekend? And I remember a long, long period where it felt like there were dozens, couldn't have been dozens, but several people in my class would say, my dad got made redundant, he, my dad was a fitter, he's lost his job, my father was a welder, my mother worked in the canteen. There were not many women in those days who, who were uh, time-served uh, tradespeople. But the point was that so many of them, the parents, all the parents, both the parents lost their jobs. And many, for many of my classmates, the last time, as we grew up, the last time they could remember the parents working was when they were 12. So they have very little memory of working parents. And where you have that generational unemployment, where you have an area where expectations are low, surely our job is to raise their expectations, surely it's to give them confidence, give them self-belief, work with them, not against them, give them additional support, not less support and certainly not punishment. I want to look at what I believe uh, lies behind the government's sanctions agenda. Well, I'll start with what they say lies behind it. They say it's to teach claimants that you can't expect something for nothing. I want to look at my constituents and perhaps the Minister will tell me for each of these constituents what they were supposed to learn from this. So Sarah was late for an interview, not very late, but she was sanctioned. She was late because there was an accident on the road and the bus she was on was stuck in traffic. It wasn't her fault. What is she to learn from that? Uh, Another constituent was told that she had to come for an interview at the job centre. She was given a week's notice and they said, we want you to come next Wednesday at 3pm. And she said, oh, but I pick up my six-year-old from school at 3pm. Well, that's just tough. Her parents lived 100 miles away. That's just tough. You either come to the interview or we sanction your benefits. What was she to learn from that? Abandon the child at the school playground or take the child out of school, which is what she did do and that child missed an hour's education. I have a constituent in Royston Hill, a couple. Um, the wife went into labour, um, having a baby, not the party. Um, and, I don't know why I said that. <laughs> the wife went into labour and he, the husband, unsurprisingly, went with her. He had no credit to phone and say that he wouldn't be signing on that day, so he went the next day. Six weeks they were sanctioned for. Welcome to the world, tiny baby. Your parents are getting no money for six weeks and not even a single milk token. What is that couple to learn from that sanction? That he should have abandoned his wife and left her to it? And before anyone starts thinking, you know, these are long-term unemployed, blah, 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 blah. This couple, their daughter's two and they're both working now. They were both working up until six months before she had the baby. They were not people who didn't want to work and they learned nothing from that except that the government doesn't actually care about them. I have a constituent now who has mental health problems and a visual impairment. He has severe panic attacks. A condition of his ESA is that he attends um, an office in the city centre, it's either once a month or once a week, whatever. It takes him hours, he gets lost, he gets distressed. And, and he was asked, what is it you do when you get there? And he said, well, I just sign a bit of paper and leave. Why? What is the point in that? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that would be very helpful if you would do that. <laughs> helpful but also to, to, to make a point she, she's raising uh, some tough cases and some interesting cases uh, but does she recognize that there is a test of, of good cause or, or good reason um, that can be employed in order where there is good reason for these sanctions not to be imposed yeah I do recognize that but one of the most active welfare rights uh, <coughs> providers in my constituency uh, in Barmulloch tell me that most people do not ask for a mandatory reconsideration the couple I was talking about with the baby didn't know that they could apply for a mandatory reconsideration. Now, no doubt they were given a leaflet, but they were so distressed and so busy working out what they were going to do with this baby when they had absolutely no money for six weeks that they didn't do it. Um, so, yes, so we can all agree, and I'm quite sure that everyone here will agree, that all those cases that I cited cannot be justified and those decisions were wrong, but these are not exceptions. These are the people who are losing money for absolutely unacceptable reasons, and I want to look at an exception now. 
The people who the Minister will no doubt argue should be sanctioned, those who are deemed not to be doing enough to find work. Well, I can tell you a little about this because I was one of them, apparently. I recently spent a significant period of time looking for work. I started off confident, certain that I would find something fulfilling and reasonable, reasonably well paid, and I was prepared not to limit myself. I would spend days putting my heart and soul into applying for jobs I just knew I would be offered an interview for. And I can tell you that rejection is very hard to take, but no acknowledgement is even harder to take. When you've put your heart and soul into something, to be treated as if you don't exist, as if you're invisible, was soul-destroying. And some weeks, I confess, I could not face it. I couldn't pluck up the, the energy to try to write in the confident wa manner in which you must write if you're going to impress a potential employer. Should I have been sanctioned? Because that's what's happening to people now. Should I have been punished or should I and should they be given a bit of additional support and acknowledgement of the fact that it's a very stressful, extremely low paid, full time job finding a job. Is it really so difficult to understand why sometimes claimants just need to clear their head and build their confidence again? I would argue, and it's very clear to me, that what lies behind this benefits regime, the sanctions regime, is an ideologically driven determination to drive people further into the ground, to show them who's boss, to pander to the red tops who are telling people about these layabouts, living the life of Riley, never worked a day in their lives, never wanted to because we, the poor downtrodden workers, are doing it for them. We're paying, paying them way too much to sit about on their backsides all day. It's utter nonsense and anyone who argues that should be completely ashamed of themselves. And if the member wants to argue that, carry on. I'm very grateful indeed. She's been very generous with her time, and in particular with, with me intervening on her. Um, but I can't let her get, get away with the accusation that we on this side are determined to drive people into the ground. It's the exact opposite. It's intended to drive people into work, not into the ground. And for the members of the SNP to accuse the members on this side of wanting to drive people into the ground and not into work is to miss the point entirely. No, we're not, we're not, we're not missing the point. Most of us on these benches have been there ourselves. Most of us have been unemployed and looking for work. None of us have a silver spoon in our mouths. None of us have jobs for the boys. All of us have experienced that. Most of us have experienced living on benefits. And I am telling the member that the way to get people into work is to support them, is to understand them, is to build their confidence. It's not to attack them. It's not to threaten them. And it's certainly not to take away the means by which they manage to feed and clothe themselves and their children. Yeah. Yes. Neil, <laughs> I'm a Neil Coyle. Thank you, thank you very much for that. <laughs> <laughs> well, does she share my concern that, that you know, with despicable comments uh, that we've just heard, actually when we are talking about disabled people with mental health conditions, learning disabilities, a quarter of a million on employment support allowance who have been found unfit for work, it's quite disgraceful to be pretending this is about supporting them back into work. It's about taking money from very disadvantaged people. I'm a job, by completely agreeing with the Honourable Member for somewhere. Bermondsey, that's <laughs> Bermondsey, very nice place. Um, and, 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 and telling uh, everyone here that I uh, have had a constituent crying on the phone to me, a grown man who once had a lot of self-respect, who once had a really tough job that he, he, he worked really hard at, became ill, he's not believed, and he's now talking to me about ending his life. And I don't know what to say to him. So for the member to pretend that this is all about getting people into work, why don't you listen? Why doesn't he listen to what we're telling him? Why doesn't he listen to the evidence and realise that, that that's what he may believe, but he really needs to open his ears and start listening to people? Yeah, yeah. Here, here. Kirsty Blackman. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I actually don't know how to follow my colleague. She was excellent. Um, 